The Andersonville National Historic Site, located near Andersonville, Georgia, preserves the former Camp Sumter also known as Andersonville Prison, a Confederate prisoner of war camp during the final 12 months of the American Civil War. Most of the site lies in southwestern Macon County, adjacent to the east side of the town of Andersonville. As well as the former prison, the site contains the Andersonville National Cemetery and the National Prisoner of War Museum. The prison was made in February 1864 and served to April 1865. The site was commanded by Captain Henry Wirtz, who was tried and executed after the war for war crimes. It was overcrowded to four times its capacity, with an inadequate water supply, inadequate food rations, and unsanitary conditions. Of the approximately 45,000 Union prisoners held at Camp Sumter during the war, nearly 13,000 died. The chief causes of death were scurvy, diarrhea, and dysentery. Conditions The prison, which opened in February 1864, originally covered about 16.5 acres (6.7 hectares) of land enclosed by a 15-foot (4.6 meters) high stockade. In June 1864, it was enlarged to 26.5 acres (10.7 hectares). The stockade was rectangular, of dimensions 1,620 feet (490 meters) by 779 feet (237 meters). There were two entrances on the west side of the stockade, known as North Entrance and South Entrance. Topic: <laughs> Descriptions of Andersonville. Robert H. Kellogg, sergeant major in the 16th Regiment Connecticut Volunteers, described his entry as a prisoner into the prison camp, May 2, 1864. As we entered the place, a spectacle met our eyes that almost froze our blood with horror, and made our hearts fail within us. Before us were forms that had once been active and erect—stalwart men, now nothing but mere walking skeletons, covered with filth and vermin. Many of our men, in the heat and intensity of their feeling, exclaimed with earnestness, Can this be hell? God protect us! And all thought that he alone could bring them out alive from so terrible a place. In the center of the hole was a swamp, occupying about three or four acres of the narrowed limits, and a part of this marshy place had been used by the prisoners as a sink, and excrement covered the ground, the scent arising from which was suffocating. The ground allotted to our ninety was near the edge of this plague spot, and how we were to live through the warm summer weather in the midst of such fearful surroundings, was more than we cared to think of just then. Further descriptions of the camp can be found in the diary of Ransom Chadwick, a member of the 85th New York Infantry Regiment. Chadwick and his regimental mates were taken to the Andersonville prison, arriving on April 30, 1864. An extensive and detailed diary was kept by John L. Ransom of his time as a prisoner at Andersonville. Father Peter Whalen arrived on 16 June 1864 to muster the resources of the Catholic Church and help provide relief to the prisoners. The dead line At Andersonville, a light fence known as the dead line was erected approximately 19 feet meters inside the stockade wall. It demarcated a no-man's land that kept prisoners away from the stockade wall, which was made of rough-hewn logs about 16 feet meters high and stakes driven into the ground. Anyone crossing or even touching this dead line was shot without warning by sentries in the pigeon roosts. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Health problems. At this stage of the war, Andersonville prison was frequently undersupplied with food. By 1864, not only civilians living within the Confederacy but also the soldiers of the Confederate Army itself were struggling to obtain sufficient quantities of food. The shortage of fare was suffered by prisoners and Confederate personnel alike within the fort, but the prisoners received less than the guards, who unlike their captives did not become severely emaciated or suffer from scurvy a consequence of vitamin C deficiency due to a lack of fresh fruits and vegetables in their diet. 
The latter was likely a major cause of the camp's high mortality rate, as well as dysentery and typhoid fever, which were the result of filthy living conditions and poor sanitation. The only source of drinking water originated from a creek which also served as the camp's latrine, which was filled at all times with fecal matter from thousands of sick and dying men. Even when sufficient quantities of supplies were available, they were of poor quality and inadequately prepared. There were no new outfits given to prisoners, whose own clothing was often falling to pieces. In some cases, garments were taken from the dead. John McElroy, a prisoner at Andersonville, recalled, Before one was fairly cold his clothes would be appropriated and divided, and I have seen many sharp fights between contesting claimants. Although the prison was surrounded by forest, very little wood was allowed to the prisoners for warmth or cooking. This, along with the lack of utensils, made it almost impossible for the prisoners to cook the meager food rations they received, which consisted of poorly milled cornflour. During the summer of 1864, Union prisoners suffered greatly from hunger, exposure and disease. Within seven months, about a third had died from dysentery and scurvy, they were buried in mass graves, the standard practice for Confederate prison authorities at Andersonville. In 1864, the Confederate Surgeon General asked Joseph Jones, an expert on infectious disease, to investigate the high mortality rate at the camp. He concluded that it was due to scorbutic dysentery, bloody diarrhea caused by vitamin C deficiency. In 2010, the historian Drizdal said that hookworm disease, a condition not recognized or known during the Civil War, was the major cause of much of the fatalities amongst the prisoners. The water supply from Stockade Creek became polluted when too many Union prisoners were housed by the Confederate authorities within the prison walls. Part of the creek was used as a sink, and the men were forced to wash themselves in the creek. Topic. Survival and social networks At the time of the Civil War, the concept of a prisoner of war camp was still new. It was as late as 1863 when President Lincoln demanded a code of conduct be instituted to guarantee prisoners of war the entitlement to food and medical treatment and to protect them from enslavement, torture, and murder. Andersonville did not provide its occupants with these guarantees, therefore, the prisoners at Andersonville, without any sort of law enforcement or protections, functioned more closely to a primitive society than a civil one. As such, survival often depended on the strength of a prisoner's social network within the prison. A prisoner with friends inside Andersonville was more likely to survive than a lonesome prisoner. Social networks provided prisoners with food, clothes, shelter, moral support, trading opportunities, and protection against other prisoners. One study found that a prisoner having a strong social network within Andersonville had a statistically significant positive effect on survival probabilities, and that the closer the ties between friends is measured by such identifiers as ethnicity, kinship, and the same hometown, the bigger the effect. Topic. The Raiders The guards, disease, starvation and exposure were not all that prisoners had to deal with. A group of prisoners, calling themselves the Andersonville Raiders, attacked their fellow inmates to steal food, jewelry, money and clothing. They were armed mostly with clubs and killed to get what they wanted. Another group rose up, organized by Peter, Big Pete, Aubrey, to stop the larceny, calling themselves, Regulators. They caught nearly all of the raiders, who were tried by the regulators' judge, Peter McCullough, and jury, selected from a group of new prisoners. This jury, upon finding the raiders guilty, set punishment that included running the gauntlet, being sent to the stocks, ball and chain, and in six cases, hanging. The conditions were so poor that in July 1864, Captain Wirtz paroled five Union soldiers to deliver a petition signed by the majority of Andersonville's prisoners asking that the Union reinstate prisoner exchanges in order to relieve the overcrowding and allow prisoners to leave these terrible conditions. That request was denied. The Union soldiers, who had sworn to do so, returned to report this to their comrades. Topic. Confederacy's offer to release prisoners In the latter part of the summer of 1864, the Confederacy offered to conditionally release prisoners if the Union would send ships to retrieve them Andersonville is inland, with access possible only via rail and road. 
In the autumn of 1864, after the capture of Atlanta, all the prisoners who were well enough to be moved were sent to Millen, Georgia, and Florence, South Carolina. At Millen, better arrangements prevailed. After General William Tecumseh Sherman began his march to the sea, the prisoners were returned to Andersonville. During the war, 45,000 prisoners were received at Andersonville Prison, of these nearly 13,000 died. The nature and causes of the deaths are a continuing source of controversy among historians. Some contend that the deaths resulted from deliberate Confederate war crimes against Union prisoners, while others state that they resulted from disease promoted by severe overcrowding, the food shortage in the Confederate states, the prison officials' incompetence, and the breakdown of the prisoner exchange system, caused by the Confederacy's refusal to include blacks in the exchanges, thus overfilling the stockade. During the war, disease was the primary cause of death in both armies, suggesting that infectious disease was a chronic problem, due to poor sanitation in regular as well as prison camps. <laughs> Prisoner population <laughs> Dorrance Atwater A young Union prisoner, Dorrance Atwater, was chosen to record the names and numbers of the dead at Andersonville, for use by the Confederacy and the federal government after the war ended. He believed, correctly, the federal government would never see the list. Therefore, he sat next to Henry Wirtz, who was in charge of the prison pen, and secretly kept his own list among other papers. When Atwater was released, he put the list in his bag and took it through the lines without being caught. It was published by the New York Tribune when Horace Greeley, the paper's owner, learned the federal government had refused the list and given Atwater much grief. It was Atwater's opinion that Andersonville's commanding officer was trying to ensure that Union prisoners would be rendered unfit to fight if they survived. <laughs> Newell Birch P.O.W. Newell Birch also recorded Andersonville's decrepit conditions in his diary. A member of the 154th New York Volunteer Infantry, Birch was captured on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. He was first imprisoned at Belle Isle in Richmond, Virginia, and then Andersonville. He is credited with being the longest held Union prisoner of war during the Civil War, surviving a total of 661 days in Confederate hands. His original diary is in the collection of the Dunn County Historical Society in Menomonee, Wisconsin. A mimeographed copy is held by the Wisconsin Historical Society. Topic: <laughs> Escapes. Planning an escape from this camp was routine among the thousands of prisoners. Most men formed units to burrow out of the camp using tunnels. The locations of the tunnels would aim towards nearby forests 50 feet from the wall. Once out, escape was nearly impossible due to the poor health of prisoners. Prisoners caught trying to escape were denied rations, chain-ganged, or killed. More creative methods were tried including playing dead. The death rate of the camp being around 100 per day made disposing of bodies a relaxed procedure by the guards. Prisoners would pretend to be dead and carried out to the row of dead bodies outside of the walls. As soon as night fell the men would get up and run. Once Wirtz learned of this practice he ordered an examination by surgeons on all bodies taken out of the camp. Confederate records show that 351 prisoners about 0.7% of all inmates escaped, though many were recaptured. The U.S. Army lists 32 as returning to Union lines, of the rest, some likely simply returned to civilian life without notifying the military, while others probably died. Liberation Andersonville Prison was liberated in May 1865. Trial After the war, Henry Wirtz, commandant of the inner stockade at Camp Sumter, was tried by a military tribunal on charges of war crimes. The trial was presided over by Union General Lew Wallace and featured Chief Judge Advocate General Jag Prosecutor Norton Parker Chipman. A number of former prisoners testified about conditions at Andersonville, many accusing Wirtz of specific acts of cruelty, for some of which Wirtz was not even present in the camp. 
The court also considered official correspondence from captured Confederate records. Perhaps the most damaging was a letter to the Confederate Surgeon General by Dr. James Jones, who in 1864 was sent by Richmond to investigate conditions at Camp Sumter. Jones had been appalled by what he found, and reported he vomited twice and contracted influenza from the single hour heed toward the camp. His graphically detailed report to his superiors all but closed the case for the prosecution. Wirtz presented evidence that he had pleaded to Confederate authorities to try to get more food and that he had tried to improve the conditions for the prisoners inside. However, he was found guilty and was sentenced to death, and on November 10, 1865, he was hanged. Wirtz was the only Confederate official to be tried and convicted of war crimes resulting from the Civil War, but see reference to Champ Ferguson. The revelation of the prisoners' sufferings was one of the factors that shaped public opinion in the North regarding the South after the close of the Civil War. <laughs> Aftermath In 1890, the Grand Army of the Republic, Department of Georgia, bought the site of Andersonville Prison through membership and subscriptions. In 1910, the site was donated to the federal government by the Women's Relief Corps, auxiliary to the Grand Army of the Republic. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> National Prisoner of War Museum. The National Prisoner of War Museum opened in 1998 as a memorial to all American prisoners of war. Exhibits use art, photographs, displays, and video presentations to depict the capture, living conditions, hardships, and experiences of American prisoners of war in all periods. The museum also serves as the park's visitor center. <laughs> Andersonville National Cemetery The cemetery is the final resting place for the Union prisoners who died while being held at Camp Sumter, Andersonville as POWs. The prisoners' burial ground at Camp Sumter has been made a national cemetery. It contains 13,714 graves, of which 921 are marked, unknown. As a national cemetery, it is also used as a burial place for more recent veterans and their dependents. Visitors can walk the 26.5 acre 10 .7 hectares site of Camp Sumter, which has been outlined with double rows of white posts. Two sections of the stockade wall have been reconstructed, the north gate and the northeast corner. Notable monuments and burials Medal of Honor recipients: Luther H. Story, 1931 to 1950, from nearby Buena Vista, for action in the Korean War, September 1, 1950, Cenotaph. Topic: <laughs> Depictions in popular culture. Andersonville, 1955, is a novel by McKinley Contour concerning the Andersonville prison. It won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1956. The Andersonville Trial 1970, a PBS television adaptation of a 1959 Broadway play. It depicts the 1865 trial of Andersonville Commandant Henry Wirtz. The TV movie Andersonville 1996, directed by John Frankenheimer, tells the story of the notorious Confederate prison camp. Gene Hackman, Daniel Lenihan 2008. Escape from Andersonville, a novel of the Civil War. Macmillan. p. 352. ISBN 0-312-36373-7. Retrieved 14 August 2011. Max R. Terman's Hiram's Honor, Reliving Private Terman's Civil War 2009, Hillsborough, Case, Tessa Books, ISBN 0-615-27812-4, is an historical novel. In the TV series Hell on Wheels, the villainous character Thor Gunderson is a survivor of Andersonville. His experiences there have left deep mental scars and fuel his hatred of the protagonist, Confederate veteran Cullen Bohannon, the railway foreman. In the depths of his madness, Gunderson begins calling himself, Mr. Anderson. This camp is briefly mentioned in The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, as Angel Eyes Lee Van Cleef uses it as an excuse to rule his camp with an iron fist. 
This is one of the most visible historical errors anachronisms in the film, since it is set during the New Mexico campaign, two years before the opening of the prison. The novel Inferno, by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell, contains a brief reference to the camp. In the novel, set in Hell, Billy the Kid remarks that, The guy who ran the Andersonville prison camp is being eternally tortured on an island in Phlegathon, the river of boiling blood. A novel written in 2014 by Tracy Groot entitled The Sentinels of Andersonville depicts some of the historical players such as Capt. Henry Wirtz and General John Winder and fictional prisoners in Andersonville Prison as rebel neighbors, attempting to help the prisoners, were vilified by the town of Americus, Ga. Stephen Vincent Benet's epic John Brown's Body refers to Andersonville and Wirtz's trial as one of two incidents emblematic of the Civil War POW camps. In the seventh episode of Ken Burns's 1990 PBS TV miniseries The Civil War, 1864, Most Hallowed Ground, a segment entitled, Can Those Be Men? is devoted to Andersonville. Its title derives from a quote by Walt Whitman, voiced in the film by Garrison Keillor, which runs in part, Can Those Be Men? Are they not really corpses? The dead there are not to be pitied as much as some of the living that come from there, if they can be called living. Topic Gallery Topic Andersonville National Cemetery Topic See also Camp Douglas Dix Hill Cartel, the agreement reached in July 1862 to regulate prisoner of war exchanges. Elmira Prison Florence Stockade Immortal 600 Libby Prison Magnolia Springs State Park Camp Lawton, Salisbury Prison <laughs>